Hi there, it's William from Boxer 2 Valve back again and we're going to finish things off today on this project that's been going on for a little bit of time now. Since the last time when we put the motor together and all that finally, um, I did get the exhaust in place and it took a little fiddling around because the, this was an older bike, the foot peg brackets I think maybe from falling over at some time or another were a little bit bent so it needed need to do a little adjusting here and there because the goal was really to get the exhaust nicely symmetrically placed and all evened up and get all the clamps in place so it turned out really really good and it's a really awesome exhaust so really the last thing we need to do is oh yeah I also went ahead and got the spark plugs in um, the plugs I was waiting for were the W7 DC those are the non-resistor plugs that are the correct plugs for this bike and we finally got those they've been kind of hard to get and um, so those are those are put in and um, I, I did start the motor already in full disclosure it has been run as you can see the pipes a little bit yellow but it's really you know it fired right up no no problem and then um, we're going to go through the process of setting the ignition timing on one, on one of these now there there was a special tool for setting static timing available way back when but um, you can kind of, in my opinion, kind of forget it. I mean, you can get it kind of sort of in the, in the, in the middle of the adjustment and it'll, it'll be close enough to where the bike will start. And then just immediately get a timing light on the, on the uh, flywheel and, and dial the timing in. And that, that really is the, the best way to do it. So if you have a timing light, this is an old snap-on timing light that I've had it forever. It's so old, in fact, that it's made in USA, if you can believe that. And um, what I did on this a long time ago is I, I put the, an accessory outlet on there because it's all I ever work on, really. But if needed, plug that in, goes to the battery. And you can do that with any kind of timing light that you that, that you might have or acquire or just go straight to the battery. But it's sometimes just easier to plug it into the outlet. Or what's even better yet is one that's self-powered. These are, are no longer made. I don't know where you'd even find one of these, but there are other timing lights out there that are self-powered. So basically what that means is it has a, has a battery inside of it so you don't need a power source. Just clip that onto the wire like that. And now I'm going to first go ahead and uh, reconnect the ground strap. All right, so full function check. We've got turn signals, horn, and high beam. Everything's good. Let's see if we have motor too. So a little choke. Okay, so just gonna go in the window. Okay, so you should see, you'll see there's an OT mark and the S mark when it's um, at idle approximately, but more important than that, way more important than that is at the Z mark is in the window at uh, RPM of about 3,000 and uh, some change and above. So we go look at that and... And that's, that's what we're looking for. Now to make adjustments to that, a four millimeter Allen wrench, loosen the two screws here. Just loosen a little bit so you can still turn the canister. And to do that, really, it helps if you get a friend to help you because it's really hard to hold a timing light in one hand, turn the canister with the other hand, and rev the throttle. So you need somebody to give, give gas while you set the timing. And, um, and, then, and then that's really all there is to it. Um, still need to do the carburetors, but I'm going to do that outside because it's, we don't have really the best ventilation system here yet. And... Uh, we like to do that outside, but at least I know the timing is all set, so I can go ahead and put the, put the bike back together again, put the front cover on and so on. And then 
just a couple of little details I want to work out too. So before putting the front cover on, disconnect the battery. And in a previous episode, we, you saw how we, um, in case you missed that, we uh, cut the ring connector out, a little piece of it, so that it just slips right over the bolt. It just makes it a lot easier than having to take the bolt out all the time. So this is a very important thing to do because it, despite how careful you might be, you could brush up against the diode board and cause damage that you could easily avoid by just taking the time to disconnect the uh, battery. Okay, so that's all good to go. So there's one more little detail I want to do before I take it off a lift and, and put it uh, outside is these bolts for the footrests. This is one of those things that these are really, really bugger, they're really ugly, and I've seen this very commonly. So actually, just got these in. These are replacement bolts for this exact purpose. And these are special bolts because they're, they've got a very shallow head on them and that's why they get rounded out, I think. Also, there is a special tool for this type of bolt. It has like a little pilot nose on there and the corresponding hole in the middle of the bolt. And this is actually the, the proper tool for this type of bolt. And a lot of people don't have that. They just take an eight millimeter Allen, stick it in there, and it's only going in a few millimeters and then they get rounded out. So we're gonna take a moment to just replace these because um, I think it'll just look a whole lot better than that buggered up bolt there. Here we go, stainless equivalent, very cool. So it takes a 40 millimeter on the left hand side with a nut, which we also have in stainless to go with it, and the 30 millimeter on the right hand side. So change this one out first, of course. There we go. It looks so much better. So this one is so buggered that it's going to have to be re drilled out. I already tried doing this, but I hammered that in tight as I can, and then it just it just spins. It just like last time that was in when in was the last time that worked. So kind of a drag, but just going to drill it out. All you have to all you really have to do is drill it out far enough so that the head pops off. So it won't take much be being a shallow bolt like this. Trisa, batteries are dead. Don't have the charger for this one here, so I'm just gonna switch drills, I think is gonna be the best way to go. Use this one instead. And a little bit of cutting oil good thing too. There we go. That's it. Just basically progressively increased the size of the bit till I got to 10 millimeter, which is the size of it and just snapped right off. So I made quick work of that. We can get rid of that bolt. Okay, so that's set two. Alrighty, so actually, I can't really think of anything else that I wanna do. I think we've pretty much gone through it all and gone through and double checked the fasteners. I did that um, when I, after I finished the exhaust. I also did the uh, side stand and you see it looks like brand new and actually, 
it was painted with this special paint from Fatan that we offer, and it's the most incredible paint. We, we blasted it down to bare metal, and then using this Fatan spray paint, it has this incredible long-lasting finish. The, the entire product range of Fatan, this paint, is great. They also make a uh, kit to reseal your tank. It has a um, red color, just like the original paint. It's just amazing. And there's this new thing that I just got these in. I'm very excited about the multi-purpose oil. If you, you know, using uh, anything you might use WD-40 on, try the, you gotta try this stuff. It's just amazing. It has some really good clinging properties. Uh, so it stays on the uh, area it's put on. So anyway, just thought I'd mention the Fertan product line from Germany, which we carry the full uh, product line of that. So check that out. Um, when you get a chance. So I'm going to just lower the bike down now and roll it outside and we'll, we'll do a little carburetor adjustment and then we'll uh, think about getting ready for a ride. All right, we're going to sink the carbs now and um, I've got this really cool carb mate from TechMate. This is a really awesome tool uh, for sinking the carburetors. Um, something that we, we carry and highly recommend. Uh, well, I'm just for kicks, I'm going to try to do it by ear first, and then we'll see how close I got with this in a bit. I'll go through this in a bit. So um, the first thing you want to do is we kind of went through the base adjustments on um, the carburetor rebuild, but essentially you, you want to refer to that. So you want the, the uh, throttle shaft screw turned in so it's just uh, opening the throttle by uh, little bits. The throttle's not actually making full contact inside of the throttle body, inside of the carburetor, and also the air mixture screw down below that goes in till it bottoms. Don't crank on it just till you feel it bottom and then back it off like one turn to one and a half turns. Someone there, same on both sides, just so you have enough of a base setting to start. And then on the chokes, there's no real um, magic there at all. You just want to have one to two millimeters of choke play in there and then go ahead and, and uh, tighten the uh, lock nut. So you just Basically, you pull up on that until you feel some tension, have a little bit of, of a gap, and try to get it pretty close to the same on both sides. On the, th on the throttles, you also will just want to have some gap. We're going to be making some adjustments, so m most important thing is you've got some, some free play in there. That's the most important thing for this moment. So first thing we'll do now is just start this up. It's still a little bit warm from timing. You could just turn the air screw, turn it, turn it into you just hear it start to lope, and, and then back it off again on both sides. Basically, you're looking for the leanest idle you can get. You're going to start to run crappy and then back it off a little bit. Here you can you start to lope on one side. If you back it off, it wants to die, just sort of achieve a balance. If 
you can actually sort of hear it, sort of feel it. If it's uh, working okay, we can go ahead and hit these one more time. Back it out. Okay, so that's pretty close, I think, in terms of the um, idle. Now we need to adjust the throttle cables so that they're pulling the throttles open evenly. And what I do with that usually is just set one to about the gap that I'm looking for, which is something like two millimeters two and a half millimeters, just you want to have a little bit of play in there. So if there's any any uh, tightness when you turn the bars that you're not raising the idle, so you leave a little bit of play in there and then just go ahead and lock down that lock nut on there. It's just, we're basically done on that side. And now, give it a little bit of gas make some fine adjustments on the cable and make it so that it feels like it's pulling evenly on both and you can sort of hear it as you apply a little bit of throttle. You hear that little bit of stutter, a little bit less free, free play. That's not good. So I think I, I, I got it pretty close. Let's see, I'm sure it's not perfect, but we'll put the gauge on now and really fine tune it. So you need to have a um, power source for this and you can hook up to the vehicle battery, no problem, or I just happen to have a, a battery here and we'll just hook that up to the battery. And then the first thing we do is you need to zero it until the center green light comes on. You see that as I turn it one way or the other, it's going to move. But when I get to a little smiley face there and sort of like sort of center that in best possible, you can see where it, as you turn it, the LED kind of note where that is on both ends of the spectrum and try to center, center that or st straight up. Then we go ahead and connect the hoses. So originally there were vacuum hoses that came down here to these ports on there and your bike may still have them on there if you have the secondary air system. Otherwise you need to then first remove the vacuum screws and if you have vacuum hoses going to them, and that's all you have, then just remove the vacuum hoses. There we go, and put the vacuum hose from the tester onto that port on both sides. All right, let's give this a whirl. So it looks like I got pretty close on, on uh, <laughs> the idle, but not exact. So let's go ahead and this is a really cool because it can really help you fine tune the bike. 
So you just see, I just made a small adjustment there. And it actually does sound better. Beautiful, okay. And then, and then on the cables, make our adjustments until we get that green, steady green light on there with the, plus the, the uh, ones not flashing, just, just the green light. And now we've got the cable synchronized. Very, very cool. And then we'll just, Go ahead and lock that knot down. Double check. Okay. Cables are in perfect synchronization, I'd say. We're very close to it. And maybe you can make even a drilling in a little bit. But you know we're gonna be re redoing it in, at the 600 mile service anyway. I don't want it to get too hot, so I think I think we're good. And uh, it, it sounds sounds and, and runs well. It's ready for the first long ride. And I'm going to go ahead and put, put the vacuum screws in and get ready to go for a ride. All right. Well, this is a really big day, one that I've been looking forward to for a really long time. Finally, after many months, it seemed like it took forever to put this bike together, but it really so stoked with the way it turned out. It's really cool. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun to ride. And so the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to take it out and put five or 600 miles on it. Nice break in ride. And then we're going to drain the fluids, retorque the heads, set the valves and, and get everything just super spot on after that. And not only that, but it's really a super cool thing in that my son Hans is here from Germany again visiting. He's studying over there and um, he's going to be riding our R80 from 1986, which is also a mono lever, has the same shock absorber, the same tires, and also has a Siebenrock 1000cc kit. So we've got two basic matching dueling mono lever machines. We're going to go tear it up on the beautiful roads of North Carolina and maybe pop up into Virginia is our plan. And even more special, not maybe not, or also almost equally as cool, is about more than 30 years ago, I rode with another guy named Hans, which is, happens to really be his namesake, Hans Jörg. And um, he was visiting from Germany and we rode the same two colored bikes as you see this picture right here. And so anyway, it's like a really special event. I'm happy you're here. I think we're gonna have a good time. What do you think? I think so too. Yeah, it's gonna be cool. You ready? Should yeah. we head off? Let's go. Let's do it. Okay. And what a cool ride, huh? Awesome we did it. Ride. We got all those miles in. And these bikes were, that was a lot of fun, huh? Was awesome. What was it like riding a bike that's like more than 10 years older than you, man? Pretty well, wild, huh? Say, I've always liked riding this already. We've had, we've had it for many years now. And it's, it's always been my favorite bike to ride back in high school, taking it all across on day trips, taking it to the beach or yeah. where I wanted to go. I mean, I like modern bikes a lot as well. But really, an airhead and or this R80 is all you really need. Yeah. And I mean, it's got plenty of power, especially with that Stephen Rock kit in there. It handles well, looks great, sounds great. I mean, what, what more could you ask for? Well, not much. It, two of them. Two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and this thing did really awesome too. I gotta say. I mean, it all 
Worked so well, suspension's good, the motor's really strong, the brakes work great, just the whole thing was like just amazing. They even kind of worked out pretty slick the way we put the SP Connect, put the phone there. And um, yeah, so now we're gonna, we're gonna take that in the shop and um, get the oil drain in and then let it cool a bit and then retorque the heads and adjust the valves and stuff. So let's get cracking on that. You can maybe help me move some bikes out of the way in here. Cool. You know what? If you move that silver bike out of the way, I think that'll work. I can snake it through. So we're hot off the road. We had a nice little extra ride this morning and I, I want to get the oil out fully at operating temperature as much as possible. So we just rolled in and it's still nice and hot. So this is a really cool drain pan, by the way. I like you put your filter on here so that it drains out. Pretty slick deal. And, um, the other day somebody commented on one of the videos and said, why didn't you drain the oil first and then take the filter out? I was like, kind of got me thinking, you know, it does make sense to pull the filter first, even though I never really ever did it that way. I mean, I think it's a pretty good idea because that way the filter will drain down into the sump and once you pull the drain plug out, everything flows out at once. So I'm gonna actually, start with by doing that see how that works out so what came out of here is a o-ring gasket which we put in before and the shim the, you're gonna the kit's gonna come with new ones so I'm just gonna go ahead and replace all those to get the filter out, a little hook tool, something like that works pretty good. You can just go in there and grab it, pull it out like that. All right. Before I pull the drain plug out, I'm just going to take a dipstick and uh, unscrew it. Basically just unscrew the dipstick and kind of let it hang there so that it can vent out um, really well. So now relocate. Really take the pan and go ahead and get that plug out of there, get that break in oil out of there. Some of the darkness you see is probably some of the assembly lube that we used on the lifters on the cam and rod bearings and so on. But uh, yeah, it's got about 600 miles on this motor. So I think, you know, that's a very important for a service, about a thousand kilometers. And uh, so we let that, th that drain. And then at the same time, we did put a new fifth gear in this bike. So it has a new gear. So that's also something that bedded in there. So I'm going to go ahead and also drain the gearbox oil. And to do so, just first remove the filler plug. Just leave it loose for the moment and then get up underneath and pull the drain plug. So that you need a 19 millimeter socket. Get up down there and loosen that for starters. 
And then what I do usually is unscrew it and then get ready to take the filler plug out. Because if I take the filler plug out right now, it's probably gonna make a little bit of a mess. So just working quickly, take the drain plug out and then re remove the filler plug. And you see the difference in velocity of the oil coming out when I did that. Let that drain. And we also did, we put together a new final drive or a rebuilt an, um, a used one. Um, what the heck, I think we should go ahead and drain that oil as well. For, for draining the final drive, something like this works great because this, it's a little bit tapered and so it'll fit really nicely up underneath the drain plug as opposed to using a pan um, you, where you might you know, run the oil onto the tire. This is a pretty slick way to do it. I always take the vent off because I need to refill the final drive there. And even though really we would vent without it, you gotta, might as well take it off. That way you certainly won't forget to put oil back in there. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna actually go and get my work clothes on now and give the bike a couple hours to cool down to room temperature so we can go ahead and uh, retorque the cylinder heads, finally set the valves properly and refill it with fluids and then this bike's ready to roll. So be back in a bit. So a few hours have gone by now and everything's all cooled down to um, the, the uh, room temperature and went ahead and filled the final drive back up with uh, this 8590 gear oil, high point gear oil, measured quantity of 350 cc's and gearbox as well. Uh, if you need any reference to that, we've covered that on previous videos. And um, engine oil, I put in the uh, 15W50, now especially this time of year. It's now getting approaching autumn here in North Carolina. It's a little bit chilly. And so a little bit thinner oil when it's cold makes starting just ever so much easier. So that's what I like to use. And so that's all done. Still need to put the filter in. Just wanted to kind of go over that. There's a couple of ways you can do it. The filter that I took out was the hinged filter. This filter only comes in the kit, uh, the OX37D and the ox 36 D is for the bikes with the oil cooler. So this is the non-oil cooler. And this is the hinged filter. And you want, it comes with new O-ring, gasket, drain plug seal, all that stuff, which is kind of handy. And this is designed so you can kind of snake it in, especially useful if the bike has engine bars or crash bars or um, a fairing such as an RT or an RS. Um, this has neither, so we can also just put in the OX35 filter. The only thing about that to keep in mind is it doesn't come with the seals and all that, um, but it is just a one piece filter and it will be ideal for this bike. When you take the filter out, before you put the new one in, make sure that it has, that, that the old one comes out with these um, rubber rings on there that nothing gets uh, stuck inside there because if you put two of these on there you could crush a filter and have an oil pressure problem so it's definitely something you always want to be aware of. So I will go ahead and use this one check it in there nothing in there so it slips in as easy as that and I, the only thing is you have to buy the gaskets etc separately. Now I've got a new gasket here. If originally, I remember that the mono levers did not come with the shim nor the gasket. They just used the O-ring. And so I think there's, that worked good back then. You could get by with it. I always actually do use the gasket in any way, just in case there's any seepage. Um, the gasket's not a bad idea to have on there. And if you're going to use a gasket, even though the shim's not totally required on one of these, and I'll tell you about why in just a second, 
still you would use the shim in this case because that it has approximately the same thickness as the gasket. That way, the same um, tension is on the O-ring. Anyway, seems to make sense. Uh, on the mono lever models, what they did was they sort of flared the end of the of the little uh, canister tubing that is inside of here. On previous models, they didn't have that, so it was a little bit of a gap around the outside, right in this area here. And so the shim is designed to basically give a good solid footing for the O-ring so that it doesn't get sucked in. And when that happens, it can be catastrophic oil pressure loss, et cetera. So um, that's what the intention of that shim is. So when you have, if you have an older bike, that, that, that shim has to go in first. That is a, a definitely the case. Then you can simply put the rest of it together like this. You can just sit the O-ring on there, sort of center of the gasket, and then put that carefully into place and uh, put the bolts back in. Like that. Okay, now that's all sorted out. So let's go ahead and have a look at the valves now. Let's start by taking the spark plug out. Okay, and you can kind of get an idea about how we did on the jetting. I mean, it's got a nice tan sort of color to it. Looks okay, maybe a smidgen rich. But um, uh, I think we're on the right track. It's something to keep an eye on. It looks pretty good. And then we'll get a pan. It's going to we lose a little bit of oil here. OK, so sometimes the valve cover will just pull right off. Sometimes they're a little bit stuck on there, something like that. This wedge is what I like to use. It could kind of just go in between the, the valve cover and the cooling fins on the head, and you won't mar or damage anything. Go. So I'm also going to pull the spark plug out on the other side, too. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and put the bike into fifth gear. So we want to have the engine set at top dead center compression stroke, and so I'll put, I put my, my thumb over the spark plug hole and turn the rear wheel. And I can feel and hear the, the compression. So th there is top dead center. I can just double check it in the window over here, but I'm pretty sure that OT is going to be pretty close to visible. Yeah, it was pretty much right on. I mean, you don't, it doesn't have to be that precise. If you can feel that the um, piston came up all the way and you hear that kind of pressure coming out, then it's close enough for what we're doing. Okay, so we're going to have a look at this. And don't need the pan anymore. First thing I want to do is loosen the adjusters. And just go ahead and spin them all the way in to get maximum valve clearance. Just like that. It's totally loose. So I think it was in the last video, I kind of pointed out the, these shims that are in here. And it's, th there's a specification for the end float on these mono lever models. And they achieve that at the factory with various shims. And they come in, diff in five different sizes. I believe it's 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, and then 0.5. And it's pretty rare that you have to change them. Sometimes I suppose there'd be reason to, but what we can do is we can check the specification and see if the, um, if the end 
play is excessive or within specification. Now the specification is, I believe, 0.03 to 0.07. So good luck finding those gauges, I guess you can, but I have a 0.05 and a 0.10. So I kind of going to say 0.05 if it goes in, that's, that's cool. And if the 0.10 go, doesn't go in, then it's within the specification. So we can just simply put this right between the rocker arm. The 0.05 goes in without any problem. And the 0.10 does too. So a little bit on the excessive side on this one. Point oh five goes in. The point one really not really it's like really so tight it doesn't go in all the way. So this this one could be a little bit on the loose side. So in order to get the proper torque on these, uh, we're gonna slacken these nuts first. And I'm just gonna basically do one rocker arm at a time. In this case, because of the, the uh, bit of an excessive end float there, or end play, I'm gonna loosen both of them. And then what we've done is we've got this clamp here, which has a little uh, piece of tubing welded on both sides. And sometimes there's enough play just in the parts where they fall into place naturally and, and, and basically how these blocks fit on there that just applying a slight amount of tension on there, don't want to do much, will get you to the point where you could get that specification that you're looking for. And it actually totally will do that because it's tightening up a little bit as I can feel it here when I tighten the clamp it gets tight so it doesn't need much to get that correct corrected end float all right now I'm going to see where we are we're at the, with that feeler with the feeler gauge here and the 0.05 goes in nicely a little bit snug and the point one there's no way so this is within specification in my opinion and we did not have to actually change out any shims um, like i said it's pretty rare that you have to once they're set but if you're building one or you're upgrading from the earlier style uh, then you you supplied with the new with the upgrade kit a, a bunch of different shims and you have to you have to sort out the, the stack of shims so that you wind up with that specification of 0.03 to 0.07 end play. So that's totally awesome. Both of those are within spec from that standpoint. So on this one, since it is within spec, I'm just gonna do one at a time. I'm gonna basically slacken, tighten, and torque. Go. Now we're going to double check to make sure nothing got dislodged. 0.05 goes in a little bit snugly, beautiful, and the 0.1 does not. So now, now I'm, I'm happy with the, uh, the end play on here. When we did this originally, I didn't really bother, I could have, but they were a little bit, little bit loose, and I knew I was just going to go out and blast around for five, six hundred miles, and then come back and do this again. So, nothing really wrong, I don't think, with it being a little bit loose. I left the valve lash loose and everything loose for those first few miles, but now we're going to try to do the best job we possibly can. So, end play I think is really good, and last thing I need to do is actually tighten or retorque those um, top and bottom bolts, and. That is going to be a matter of loosen that and then so 
So we, when we were assembling the engine, we kind of did this in a cross pattern to draw everything together. And there may be, somebody will have a different opinion, and that's always how it is in life, but that you would do that the same way when you retorque. Um, I found that it really matters too much, especially when you have to address something like the uh, rocker end shaft play, then you, that kind of negates the, that, that, that option, really. So anyway, um, there are, everything's torqued down now, I think, to specification, and we'll start with adjusting the valves now. So I got a point two in there, and Gonna come up and get just a bit of tension on that and draw down that lock nut. So this feels a little bit tight. It's pretty hard to pull through. Um, if I put a little bit of tension on the rocker, on the back of the rocker up to compress all the oil and everything that's between the lifter and the, and the adjuster, it gets a lot easier. It's actually, um, a, a nice fit. So it feels tight when I push it in, but actually I think that when you compress the backside with just a moderate amount of pressure on your hand, that you're simulating really what's happening inside of the motor. And then it's an, it's actually feels like, like just like a perfect fit at that point. So that's how I set them. And uh, I'm going to go back and do the intake valve the same way. And this one takes a point 0.15. You can just sort of turn it by hand till the feeler gauge stays put. And sometimes it requires a little bit of trial and error to get it just where you want it to be. Really, I got the really same sort of result. When I push, it goes in very easily. Just fits like perfectly. And then when I relieve the pressure, it seems a little bit on the tight side, but not really. So that's, I'm gonna run that. Now I believe that the valves have seated in properly and that it should stay put. Be checking it again and probably 3,000, 4,000 miles will set the valves. I typically always ch at least check the valves, the valve clearances every time I change the oil. So now I can go ahead and put the valve cover back on this side and then go over and do the same thing on the other side. All right, so I'm gonna gather my tools and go and do the exact same thing on the other side. Okay, and now I can put the spark plug back in on this side. There, and voila, there we have it. We retook the heads, we got the valves set, and this bike really runs like a like a top so it's gonna be fun to get it back out of the road do a few more miles on it it's really turned out pretty cool i'm pretty happy with this one so um i hope you enjoyed this video series we've kind of come a long way with this when you think about where we began as an as kind of a, a bit of a ratty rt and made it into something pretty cool i mean we've we got a we had a defective final drive we replaced that with a good used one and reconditioned it. We've got a whole new exhaust system, gone through the gearbox, the motor, made some big improvements on the brakes and the suspension. So really transformed the bike, made it really, I think, pretty darn good. <laughs> and um, we'll be doing more videos as time goes on. We're always expanding and taking on new products, so check our website. From time to time, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter where we'll keep you up to date with some of the cooler things as we get them in. And um, well, we're having a lot of fun with two valve twin BMW motorcycles. I hope you are too. And if you need any help, have any questions about the project you're working on, you can go to our website and you can submit a contact form 
and a lot of the technical support questions I'll answer you when I can as soon as possible. And uh, you can also leave comments here uh, on the YouTube channel. And if you haven't seen our, our other episodes, go back and check them out. There's a whole bunch of, a lot of information. Hopefully some of it can be used by you and to your benefit. And anyway, it's been a lot of fun. This has been a great project. Kind of looking forward to the next one. Don't know what that's going to be quite yet. But in any case, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being a loyal fan of Boxer 2 Valve. We do appreciate it. My name is William, and I'm at your service. Thank you. Bye.